Hey guys, this is Rohit and today we'll be writing a simple but practical application using Go which will help us demonstrate where and how we can use some of the concurrency features that are part of the language. This will make our application faster and much more efficient. What we are building is a command line application. It will take some URLs as command line arguments. It will send get requests to all of these arguments and then display the status code from the response as output. Now, keep in mind that even though we are sending HTTP requests in this very example, they are simply placeholders for a task, a task which depends on external resources. You could very well replace these requests with, let's say, a database query or maybe a WebSocket client or maybe a web crawler or just a simple program waiting for user input. So what will you learn through this video? You'll learn about Go routines, what they are, how they work under the hood and how to properly use them along with mutexes and weight groups which are some synchronization primitives that we'll talk about. Of course you'll learn how to make HTTP requests using Go and also how to use command line arguments in Go. So let's get started. I'm going to be taking an iterative approach uh, while building this application. So we'll start off with absolutely no concurrency. We'll benchmark this application, see how much time it takes for all of the requests to complete. Then we'll add some concurrency that won't work quite the way we expect it to work. And uh, again, we'll benchmark it. And then finally, we'll add uh, some magic and make it work properly and see the difference. So I'm going to jump to Visual Studio Code here. I've created a file and there's absolutely nothing else in the folder. There's just the main.go file. So let's just start with package main, punk main. Uh, now the way I'm going to call this program is going to look something like, like this. Go run main.go, google.com, bing.com. Basically just a list of all the URLs that we are sending a request to, so on and so forth. So in order to get all of these command line arguments, we can use the os.args package. So we'll quickly just do some error checking just to make sure that we are getting sufficient arguments for our program to work. Uh, what I mean by if length of os.args less than two is that when uh, we try to access os.args at the zeroth index, we are going to have the name of our program. And after that, we are going to have all of these URLs. So we need at least two arguments in order for a program to work. If that requirement is not satisfied, however, we'll just do a log.fatal and print out the usage. So the usage is going to look something like this. URL one, URL two, and so on and so forth up to URL n. If this requirement is satisfied, we can go ahead and iterate over all of our URLs and start sending these requests. Oh, oops, I meant URL here. URL and we're going to iterate over os.args. Now, as I said, at the zeroth index, we have main.go and we don't want to send a request to main.go. So we'll start from the first index. We'll take a slice, start from the first index and I'm going to create a separate function to send requests. And let's just quickly write this function here func send request. This is going to take the URL as input and it's not going to return anything. Now the way we send requests, HTTP requests in Go is using the HTTP.get method and we pass the URL to it. This is going to return two things, the response and the error if any. We'll quickly do some error checking. If, if we do have an error, the application is going to panic quit if we don't have an error we'll just print out the status code something like this in a bracket followed by the url itself add a new line just to keep everything tidy so response dot status code and the url now we cannot just pass in url here because the url is going to be just google.com what we need is https google.com now we could just type this https part every time in our command line argument but that could get tedious so we'll just do that in code i'm just going to add https to the string so 
when this method gets called when, uh, i'm sorry when this function gets called the url will look something like https colon forward slash forward slash google.com so i think this should do the trick let's just come over to our terminal here and run this now i want to benchmark this application we want to see how much time it takes for our urls uh, for our request to complete so i'm going to use the time command i'm using git bash here so i have access to the time command from unix so go run main.go i'm going to pass in a whole lot of urls so that we can see just exactly how much time it takes uh, let's do quora.com bing.com youtube.com let's do heroku.com dev.to uh, we can do twitter.com facebook.com what else can i think of let's do gitlab.com uh, i think that's enough let's just run this application and see what do we get so we're getting 200 on all of our requests i guess uh, my internet is kind of slow so this is going this might take a while so that took 15 seconds i'll just quickly note this down here as a comment this is going to be our benchmark so our first iteration took 15.3 seconds now since you guys do not have any point of reference as to whether or not this figure this 15 second figure is good or bad i'm going to tell you that it's bad we can do much much better What's happening here is that when we enter this for loop here, we are iterating over our arguments. We start from google.com and go up to GitLab here. So let's see, let's see what happens when we are iterating over google.com. So we send the request, https google.com. This function is called, we send the request. And while the response is coming back to us, our program is doing nothing. We are simply waiting for the response to come back and uh, when the response finally does come back then we do this quick error checking and print out this this line and then the control returns back to the for loop and then we proceed to the next argument which is github.com once github.com completes once we receive the response for github then only we proceed to Quora. now we're simply wasting time when we are waiting for the response to come back right we could do we could make much better use of that time in, so while we are waiting for the response from Google to come back, we could send requests to GitHub, maybe even Quora, Bing. And whenever we receive the response from Google back, we can just print it out as it is. We don't have to wait for the response to come back. And instead, in that time, we can do some other task. And this is precisely where Go routines come in. Go routines allow our application to become asynchronous. Right now, it's synchronous. We are waiting for uh, a previous task to complete before we proceed to the next one and let's just see how we can implement go routines now, go routines are lightweight threads think of them as threads which can run functions in your go program functions or methods but they are extremely lightweight if you've used threads from other languages like java or c these are not operating system threads these are managed by the go runtime itself the go runtime will allocate a few os threads for many many go routines and it will map those go routines onto those threads now go routines are extremely cheap to create they start off with just a two kilobyte stack size and they can grow as per your need you can compare this to an operating system thread which usually has a two megabyte stack size and since they are so cheap to create since they are so lightweight you can spawn hundreds of thousands of go routines even on commodity machines and uh, you can communicate between go routines using go channels we won't be getting into go channels in this video but uh, just some extra information so how exactly do these go routines work so uh, one thing that you need to understand is that even our main function runs on its own go routine this is the main go routine and let's say your main function is producing these six go routines gr1 through six these go routines are then submitted to the go scheduler which will look at how many go routines are there what are they doing and uh, lots of other things and then it will decide how many operating system threads to allocate in this case it's allocating two threads but it's highly uh, unpredictable this is just uh, arbitrary and purely for illustration 
Now the Go scheduler will decide that let's hey this GR1 this uh, Go routine one let's map it onto the OS thread one, and then GR1 will start running. And when GR1 starts blocking, maybe it's waiting for maybe it's waiting for a response maybe it's waiting for some user input maybe it's waiting for a database query in any case whenever a go routine starts blocking the go scheduler decides that hey you can wait in the background i'm going to give this thread to some other go routines so it will perform what is called a context switch and then add go routine 3 onto the same thread now this is again this mapping is arbitrary and when Go routine one finally receives the response. It might be scheduled after go routine three, between go routine three and five, or maybe after go routine five, and then it can complete the remainder of its job. So, go routines sound really nice and they are extremely easy to work with. What we're going to do is just add one word before our function call here in order to make that function call run on a separate go routine. Now what's going to happen is when we enter this for loop every one of these uh, function calls is going to get its own go routine so all of our function calls for each of our urls is going to run concurrently now let's just quickly run this program and see what happens now this is going the result is going to be disappointing uh, yep as you can see that completed really quickly in just 2.8 seconds uh, but there's no output right I mean we want to see this piece of code getting printed onto the screen uh, where is that now if you're coming from uh, a language like Java or C++ where you have done some multi-threaded programming you might have uh, understood what's happening here if you have not let me explain so what's happening here is that once we start iterating over all of our URLs we are spawning a separate go routine for each of our URLs and we are running the send request function inside those go routines and once we are done iterating over all of our URLs, our main go routine has absolutely nothing else to do and it just quits. So even though we spawned all of these go routines for each of our URLs, they never get a chance to complete simply because the main go routine exits before them. Now the way we can solve this issue is by using something called weight groups. Now you can think of weight groups as a simple counter. Think of it as a number and every time we spawn a go routine every time we create a new go routine we add one to that weight group we increment the weight group and when that go routine finishes its execution we decrement the counter in this way when the counter becomes zero we can know for sure that all of our go routines have exited properly and we can safely exit our program so we'll quickly implement this in our code now it's really simple to do i'm going to create a global weight group because we will need this wg variable in main as well as in send request so in our main function whenever we create a new go routine we're just going to add one to the weight group and when we are done with the weight and when we are done with the go routine we just call wg dot done this will decrement the counter and finally in our main function once we are done spawning all of the go routines our main function can then wait for all of them to complete so this line of code is going to be a blocking call this will wait until the counter becomes zero it won't do anything once the counter becomes zero only then will it proceed to the next line of code which in this case is nothing and which means our program will exit only after all of our go routines complete successfully so let's just quickly run this and see what output we get. Now isn't that great? Okay, our application just completed in 5.9 seconds. That's incredible, right? That's like the first one was five was 15 seconds. This is 5.9 seconds. So we've got about 2.5 to 3 times better performance in this case. Now there's one more thing to do before we conclude for today. I don't see anything wrong with this output but actually this can look garbled this could mix up and I'll explain why let's imagine that the Google and github go routines complete at the same time and the Google go routine starts printing out its output it runs this line of code and it's printing out let's say 200 HTTPS and while it's printing this 
the Go scheduler performs a context switch and switches to the GitHub Go routine. And then the GitHub Go routine starts running and it starts printing its output, which would be something like this. Now, obviously, we don't want this to happen, right? We don't want our output to get mixed up like this. Our console in this case is being used by all of our Go routines. We have one console shared between multiple Go routines. So this is what we call a shared resource. Access to the shared resource needs to be synchronized. Only one Go routine should be allowed to access the shared resource at a time. Now, the way we do that is using something called mutexes. Now, a mutex stands for a mutually exclusive lock. It is another synchronization primitive. And as I said, it synchronizes access to shared resources. Now, the way mutexes work is that a Go routine can request the Go runtime for a mutex lock on a shared resource. If the lock is granted, then only that Go routine can use that resource until it unlocks it. In the meanwhile, while this Go routine is using that resource, if any other Go routines try to access this resource, if they try to gain uh, a mutex on that, they won't be given access and they will have to wait until the first Go routine releases the lock. You can visualize it something like this. Let's say GR1 is holding a resource, okay, and it requests a lock on this resource. The lock is granted and now GR1 can use this resource even though GR2, GR3, 4, even though they are requesting for a lock on this resource, they won't be granted the lock until GR1 releases the lock after which any go routines can then get the lock. So we can do this again very simply using the sync package. I'm going to declare a global mutex and just before our printf line, we're going to lock the mutex mute dot lock and once we are done we'll just unlock the mutex so what's going to happen here is that before we write to the console we are acquiring a lock on this resource so no other go routine will be able to run this line of code while we have this locked and once we are done executing our line we can unlock the resource uh, let's just run this program. The output should be similar. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get uh, any garbled output out on the screen. As you can see, about six seconds. So we're still doing pretty good. So that's it. That's all for today. Thank you for watching and keep going.